Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Tortoise's first Global Education Summit. Um, I don't know exactly who chose the music. I think it must have been my colleague, Sam Hockley, either clairvoyant, knowing that we were in for the sunniest day in London, or maybe that was just the spirit of the day, uh, sunny and optimistic about what we could do around education. Um, I'm enjoying as people join this first thinking of the day, uh, both the warmth of the greetings and the recognition that it's an early start for lots of people. Uh, so thank you uh, for joining us uh, at 8.15 in the morning. The reason we started quite so early is that there's so much to discuss, so much in terms of how we're rethinking education, both in what's possible and what we think we need. And if you're new to Tortoise, I just wanted to say what we're trying to do. We, a group of people, got together to form a new kind of newsroom, one that's slow, as the name suggests, one that is interested in open journalism, in being informed by everyone in the room, whether that's a physical room or a digital room, and one fundamentally that's interested in what happens next, and interested in tackling the power gap and changing the way things work. And so today is all about trying to come up with those ideas that really do rethink uh, education and not just admire the problem, but suggest what kind of revolution in education is possible. Um, we couldn't be luckier than starting that conversation this morning with Baroness Valerie Amos, Good morning, Baroness Amos. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm embarrassed to say to you that uh, that I am a former student of your uh, great institution. Uh, Baroness Amos is the director of SOAS, uh, and I did what a lot of SOAS students did, which was pretend to do the work learning Japanese upstairs, but spend more time downstairs having great radical thoughts that I'm not sure quite went anywhere. But it, it was an amazing time at SOAS, uh, and of course, um, uh, you are leading an institution right now that is facing what so many universities are facing, a great pressure and uncertainty in the light of the coronavirus. We want to talk about that. Can I just do a little bit about explaining how this works? We want to hear from as many people as possible. Because there are so many people involved, What we're, we're using a platform on Zoom that means that everyone can uh, weigh in on the chat. My colleague Basha Cummings is going to try and orchestrate or corral or, or flag up great moments in that conversation. Morning, Basha. Um, if, it's, if you can, please do let us know what you think. I'll, I'll try and bring you in in person or bring the thought that you've got into the conversation. You can also hit the participants tab and you should be able to flag up your little blue digital hand so that we can hear from you too. As I said, this is our first education summit, it wouldn't have been possible had it not been for the partnership and support of Santander, the bank that many of you know as a bank, but of course is so heavily involved in supporting students and, and universities. It wouldn't have been possible without the Nuffield Foundation and Delivery 2020, who've also been key in helping us shape and understand the approach we're taking through the course of the day. Uh, but most importantly, it wouldn't have been possible without you. Our thinkings are like open editorial meetings. They're open news meetings, we don't want questions. We want you to come and give your point of view, your expertise, your experience, so we have a more richly informed point of view ourselves. Uh, and with that, let me start with Baroness Amos. Um, Baroness but then, Amos. I say good morning first, and uh, please call me Valerie. Oh, okay. Very nice. Thank you, Valerie. Well, let's do that. But Valerie, will you let's let's just start by how you think that the coronavirus is changing how we learn and expectations of how we learn? So I think one of the things, one of the most important things is that it's all very fast. I mean, as universities, we had to change uh, very rapidly uh, as the scale and the impact of uh, the virus became clear. Uh, many of us uh, closed down most of our physical uh, campus, moved everything uh, remotely uh, in terms of the services that we would have provided uh, on campus, as well as uh, teaching, well-being, support uh, to our students. And I think the first thing I would like to say is a huge thank you, actually, to staff and students for the way in which they responded to that uh, call at SOAS, because it was not uh, easy. We did it in a few days. Uh, of course, there were lots of hitches, a lot of uh, uncertainty. But what it has pointed out uh, to us, uh, I think, is that we can move much more quickly than we ever thought we could 
in terms of bringing about change. And I think that there is a potential for transformation in the way uh, that we teach, in the way that we uh, engage the student community, in the way that uh, we engage the academic community and our support services in that. Of course, some universities were much further along uh, the way than uh, we were. Uh, some of our academic staff, we thought that they uh, would not be able to engage in uh, remote teaching uh, in quite the way uh, that they have now. They've embraced that. Uh, we changed the way that we did uh, examinations. I mean, there had to be lots of thinking and engagement uh, very, very quickly. And I think this will affect the way that we work in the future. There are some big issues around how we tackle continued uh, inequalities. We had to deal uh, with some of that just in terms of the kind of access uh, yeah. some of our students had uh, to things like the kit uh, that they needed or the places in which uh, they're able to study. But I think most importantly is that it's pointed to us that we all need and want some form of social engagement, uh, some form of uh, connectivity in terms of our learning uh, spaces and in terms of the way that uh, we take in knowledge, but it doesn't have to be in the traditional way that so many of us have offered in the past. And, and Valerie, could we talk about the change of the disruption, the speed at which people are rethinking, reworking education. I appreciate there are two elements to this. There's, there's clearly an economic and practical crisis mm -hmm. that's hitting universities. Let's come to that in a moment. Let's talk first about how digital education changes how we learn, who can learn, addresses some of those inequalities. Do you think it's going to actually reinforce those inequalities or do you think it could actually create more opportunity in education? How do you see it? I think it could create a, a huge amount more opportunity depending on how we do it and if we remember from the start uh, that we have to be conscious of these uh, uh, inequalities. We also have to be conscious, I mean SOAS is a very global university, we have students all over the world, we had to be very conscious of uh, the, uh, the kind of infrastructure in the countries in which our, our students are, are studying, uh, time zones, uh, the kinds of support that our uh, students uh, might or might not be able to have access to. What's the political environment in the countries uh, in which our students are, uh, are studying? Are they actually going to be able to uh, access everything that they need to access over the uh, internet? So there are a whole host of questions uh, to be answered. But I think that, you know, as we rethink this, mm. uh, as we really take on board the experiences uh, of doing this over the last uh, three months, how do we really, uh, uh, how can we really be creative and innovative? It's not just about, you know, can we put on more kind of short uh, programs? Uh, we've been able to be much more innovative, for example, in terms of what we offer in terms of uh, language teaching and access uh, to that uh, mm -hmm. as a result of this. So there's a lot of incredible thinking that's been going on. So I think we can uh, address some of those inequalities, but we have to be conscious of them from the start. And there'll be lots of unintended consequences that we will need to address. So, so, so can I ask some really elemental questions? Because mm -hmm. when I think about going to school or a university, I think about some really simple things. School, a place, uh, a classroom, a term, a teacher. Do you think that we are ready for a real digitization of our education in such a way that perhaps all of those four things, the, the school, the classroom, the term, the teacher, are, are going to be fundamentally changed? Or if you look five, 10 years from now, do you think that those still will be the essential elements of any educational institution? So one of the things that I think is really noticeable as we've been talking to uh, students who will be returning to SOAS, but also students who are intending to come uh, to SOAS for term one, is that so many of those students, although they are fearful of uh, the corona uh, virus, what they want is a student experience. And that student experience comes in a variety of forms. But part of it is very much about engagement with other students. It's about the way that they're able to have face-to-face -face teaching with uh, academic uh, colleagues, the way that they can learn uh, from each other. So 
Uh, I think all of those elements right, right now remain important if you're talking uh, to students, if you're talking to, to staff about what those experiences look like. I think over time, uh, I think they will change and be transformed, but I think it's very hard to look out uh, over 10 years. I think the whole shape of our education uh, system will change. I very much hope, for example, that we will have a much greater connectivity uh, between the different stages uh, of education. And the thing that we keep talking about, which is lifelong learning, that the way that we transform the structures, uh, the physical uh, infrastructure of our campuses, uh, the kind of partnerships that we engage in both nationally and internationally, I think that that will change the fundamental uh, nature of our education system. Uh, but I, right now, it's quite hard to imagine some of it 10 years out. And what, and Valerie, what do your colleagues say about exams and the disruption to exams? My, my niece said to me, actually, isn't there a lesson here that we might create a more progressive education system if we become much less reliant on examinations? How do you and colleagues at SOAS see that? So at, at SOAS, we already had a, a model which um, included exams, um, assessments, uh, we have been engaged in uh, a project over a, a very long time, uh, which uh, uh, really has been led uh, by our students, but now is a university-wide project, again, uh, which is really around framing how we decolonize our uh, curriculum, how we look at more inclusive uh, teaching, uh, linked to that, you know, what is the pedagogy of the school, and as part of that process, we have been looking at uh, the attainment gap in particular and how to address that. So against that backdrop, we have already been looking at um, assessments, exams, uh, and we moved to open book uh, exams uh, at SOAS for our final year students. There were some other uh, students in years one and two who for particular reasons and depending on the courses that they were doing also had to do uh, exams. But we did move very quickly to saying that actually those students that were continuing uh, did not this year have to take exams. And I think that that's something that not just we, but other universities will be looking at uh, very closely. But we'll be uh, having a kind of lessons learned exercise from the way that we did it uh, this year. I know that there were some anxieties uh, for our students. And as I said before, our students were all in very uh, different places uh, with different uh, access uh, to the, the internet. So there'll be some learning for us in relation to that. Well, well Valerie, we, I want to bring some people in because as you've been speaking, there have been some really interesting comments uh, and I want to hear a little about this sort of experience of online teaching. I noticed um, that the, uh, one person joined us from Hong Kong, I think on the back end of 10 weeks of online teaching, I'd quite like to hear uh, what that experience is like. Um, I see that um, Dan McKee's been making this point about the way in which we've positioned online teaching and the this, this sort of framing of it from the start. Um, so, so before we go to that crisis point in the economics of it, can we just talk about the practicalities? Um, uh, Dan, are you there? And yeah. uh, and then uh, Myra, I think. Yeah. So tell us. So so tell us a little bit about what you think of online teaching. Can we tell us a little of your experience too. Well, I'm a, I'm a secondary teacher, and I've been teaching you know online since March uh, when the schools closed. But the thing that I noticed from from day one was we all as teachers sort of wanted to make this as effective as possible, and and be as creative and as as we, as we could to make students be able to engage with it. But from day one, there was this sort of sense of, oh, it's a real shame, school is closed, we have to do it online. What can we do, you know? And then the media was saying, oh, this is terrible, the schools are closed, the students aren't gonna learn. Especially now, there's all this talk about the lost generation and all the, the damage that it's done having the schools closed. From my point of view, many of the teachers, we have been teaching consistently and school never closed other than the, the regular holidays. Um, and if we've done it well, and if we've been able to do it well, and if we put the sort of, sort of a passion into our online teaching as we do into the classroom um, we've hopefully made it as effective as it can be online which is as effective as it would be in the classroom in many cases you obviously lose lots of social elements there's the tech problems and the sort of social problems of people not having access to it 
but that's a sort of technical issue that says it can be as good we need to ensure everyone has access to a computer just like everyone has access to a school but the idea that you can't do effective education online has i think damaged the approach from the start because the mindset of teachers the mindset of students is this isn't as important i'm being told this isn't good so why am i going to put all that effort into planning a great lesson if i'm a student why am i going to put effort into doing something when my parents and the media and my teachers even are saying this isn't as good we'd love to get you back into school to do it properly um yeah so but but, but by the way i, I think there's also a, a little uh it, in all that down which is about novelty and change because i'm sure that as people got more used to it people started taking it uh taking it taking it seriously i'm thinking okay well this is school this is this is education yeah um, i think there was a it was a delay in doing that at the start yeah. because of it but also some of what made people get good at doing it now is the fact that um i think they realize not just that the novelty is worn off but they, they they are starting to realize oh i guess i have been learning this way I need to take it seriously and if I don't then you know I've got to I've got to start engaging with that learning but now that they're being told at this late stage well this last term was basically a waste of time we've got to redo yeah. everything next year I think I'm seeing with my students some of them are now starting to go well I guess maybe it's not as important I had started to engage with the online but now okay. I'm back again. Well, that's really really interesting point I'm going to value if you don't mind I'm going to try <clears throat> very frustratingly Myra uh, who's the teacher in Hong Kong? We start, can't seem to get hold of her. It's like one of those uh, uh, case in point uh, moments. Um, but 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 Caroline Hunt has just made a point that you made right at the top, Valerie, which is about access to, to equipment and technology. And I would just like to bring her in. And I can also see Claire Hookham's joined about investment in technology. So I just want to see if we could. Uh, Caroline, are you there? Hello. Hi. Yes. Sorry. Regretting I hadn't brushed my hair yet. <laughs> It's a very, it's a, it's a very it, it, look, it looks great. So they, you, all is all, all, all is fine. Um, and you, but, but but your point is that you, you're making a point about kids' access to the equipment to computers themselves, right? Yeah, because when schools shut, the government said we will get computers, we will get internet access to those who need it. But you know, if you look, uh, Barnsley Council, I believe, is one of the first that actually got access to these computers being provided the government, and that was last week. Now, schools have been shut since March, and I think online learning is brilliant. I'm a huge fan of it, but it has to be, we have to have an awareness that there are many families, many children who do not have that access, especially in families where there's more than one child. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, Caroline, thank you. I, I, I think I'm going to bring Claire Hookham in as well, if I can. Claire, are you there? Because if I, if I read your comment in the chat about the transformation in Hull, you, you were saying something similar to Valerie about the extent to which um, people really are uh, changing, adapting very quickly, but there's a need for massive investment in the infrastructure in order to have proper online learning in the way in which Dan's talking about. Let me just double check. Yes, I think, yes, I think that's right. Good morning, everybody. Apologies for my video. I'm having some Wi-Fi issues. We're pushing the, uh, we're pushing the depth of our Wi-Fi in our little village to its absolute extremes. <laughs> So uh, apologies, it's just audio. I, I, absolutely. I mean, really, um, Baroness Valerie's experience completely resonates with that that we've had at Hull. Um, and, and actually, we've had some absolute heroes come from this and some colleagues who we really would never have thought would have embraced this online learning mode have really embraced this as an opportunity and to upskill themselves. And we've seen some, some massively wonderful responses from um, such as our Teaching Excellence Academy who've created digital resources literally within hours uh, but I think there is absolutely a difference between this emergency teaching mode where we essentially took the lectures that we have prepared that were going to be delivered the very next day in front of 200 students to this online version of, OK, well, we're going to, you know, we have, we have a conference, I can, I can sort out breakout groups. It's a completely different pedagogical style. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that our students have been wonderfully forgiving of technological challenges, of us essentially fumbling our way through this I mean I had a little bit of experience of online learning um, I mean I've been an academic for about 15 years now but I certainly haven't had to teach everything online before now um, so I think our students have been very forgiving but I think as we go towards obviously I'm, I'm talking from a HE context here as we go towards a new academic year in September where we have not only new
new students joining us, um, but our continuing students who their expectations are going to be much, much higher because in their mind, we've had uh, you know many more months to get this right. We should have been investing in the technology. So I think it's, it's not just capacity in terms of throwing lots of money at this technology to get it right, um, but indeed it's looking at the way in which we teach as well. Yeah, but Claire, thank you, thank you so much, Valerie. It's 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 really interesting thinking about how we change our learning. Could, could we talk a little too about what we learn, and, and particularly in the light of the murder of George Floyd, the the Black Lives Matter movement, the the sense that we also need to really think about the prejudices and skews in our education, um, or all, all, all the way through, really. How do you think we should constructively approach that? So before I do that, can I just pick up on a couple of points that came out of uh, uh, the comments you just had, because they're entirely apt. Uh, so I think the points about uh, how we talk about the quality of what we're doing, the kind of terminology uh, that we use, the kind of messaging that's gone out there, uh, that somehow schools and universities uh, are closed. We tried very hard to keep a message out there, which was that our physical campus was closed, but that SOAS was uh, open. And I think that those points are absolutely uh, right, because there have been you know, a lot of messages which have not been about uh, the opportunity that this has given to do things uh, differently, uh, but messaging that somehow this is education that is of a lower uh, quality. Uh, and we really need to get away uh, from that. And I think also how you describe the kind of face-to-face -face, uh, teaching, the kind of group teaching that you're able to do uh, remotely, as opposed to what happens in uh, the classroom, how we might be able to move to some more hybrid uh, models, all of that is absolutely critical. And we are going through uh, a moment of uh, learning and transformation, but it is happening, happening very, very uh, rapidly. You asked a question, you asked me a question about what will the classroom uh, look like. I think there will uh, uh, still be rooms, but there'll be different kinds of rooms, and some of them will be uh, physical and some of them will be remote. To come to your particular uh, question about uh, the curriculum, one of the things that really, really worries me uh, about where we are now and the debate that we are kind of having but not really having uh, about the nature of Britain and Britain's history is that we don't teach it uh, in our schools. It's not part of our uh, national curriculum. Uh, our, our young people don't understand uh, the depth and particularity of that history and the way that that history uh, has informed our present and will continue to shape uh, our future. And it's very important that they do. Uh, and of course, you know, history, uh, how we interpret and think about that history is not static. Uh, but at the same time, if there are huge swathes of that history that collectively we don't know about, that we have not addressed, uh, it has to be uh, more inclusive because we cannot talk about Britain, uh, its diversity, uh, the injustices that exist today without understanding uh, that history. And that's one of the things that I think is important in terms of uh, the whole decolonization uh, movement. Uh, of course, there are uh, those who kind of question the term and the term itself sometimes stops people engaging uh, with it. But it's about enriching, expanding, really understanding uh, where across the world uh, there are different kinds of uh, learnings, understanding that knowledge is multifaceted, that it comes from a range of different uh, places, understanding that how you teach and who is teaching you has an impact on uh, how you learn. There's a huge amount to unpack here. We are, it feels as if we are at the beginning of uh, this movement. It's actually a movement that's been in existence for a very long time, but I think we have to speed up uh, its impact uh, because for me, it will really enrich uh, our education systems and our, the quality of our learning uh, and the depth of the knowledge uh, that we have across 
uh, different subjects. It's not just about history, it's across subjects. It, I, I, exactly. And Valerie, can you just explain, you've been in the government, you understand how things work around the cabinet table, how things work in the institutions of, of government as well, not to mention in, 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 the, in the UN. There's an element of this that potentially is really exciting. We're going to learn new things. We're going to see the world more fully and differently. But when we talk about this process, you know, it always feels incredibly defensive and depressing. You know, we need to get a committee together to consider the elements of the curriculum. You know, how do you how do you run a process that goes beyond statues and street names that thinks about our education system that does harness that energy to, to make sure that we change the way in which, as you say, who teaches us and what we learn? How, how would you go about running that process? Well, the first thing, James, is you have to believe in it. And I think that's part of the uh, problem. You have to believe in it and you have to lead it. You have to be a champion uh, because what, uh, what you're doing is actually taking on uh, a whole range of received uh, truths uh, that we have, uh, the, the, the kind of amnesia that we have about our history. So there has to be a way of saying to our nation as a whole that the history that we have held on to, as an example, uh, is a history that is only partially told. Yeah. Uh, and that, that takes guts, it takes courage, and it takes leadership because there will be a lot of people, as there are now, who say, why are you trying to take our history away? Why are you trying to tell a different truth? Uh, uh, so if you don't have that courage, if you don't have that belief, we will end up with just committee after committee, uh, recommendation after recommendation that sits on uh, the shelf. Uh, and you know, I think political leadership is yeah. about uh, really understanding uh, uh, that we need to do this for the sake of our nation and for the sake of the future uh, of our nation in terms of social cohesion and the way in which we relate uh, to each other. Uh, and the Secretary of State for Education, for example, could be taking a leadership uh, role on this in relation to uh, the national curriculum. The Prime Minister uh, could be taking uh, 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 a leadership uh, role on this in relation to how we really want uh, to reflect the, the reality of who our nation is, what we're about, and the contributions that have been made uh, from peoples across the world to building the Britain that we are today. It's a very, very straightforward message uh, in yeah. my view. But if that political leadership is not there, it's not going to happen in the way that we all want to see. So, so interesting. Thank you. I know we've just got a few minutes left. I wanted to bring in just a couple more views before we, I come back to you, Valerie, to wrap things up. One is, um, I hope that Sergi Paul is still there. Sergi, are you around? There you are. Yes. Do, let's just make sure we can hear you. Hello. Make, yes, there yeah, you are. Hello. Good morning. Hello. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, this is Sergi Paul from India, okay? Yes. So, uh, so basically, so we are discussing about education and uh, and uh, infrastructure of digital learning and all of this kind of so during the pandemic, right? Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So actually, I want to discuss about the idea. So I think that I strongly believe that education is the most powerful tool in the world, which can change the world. So. So I feel that, uh, you know, uh, digital learning is kind of different from the physical learning. So I have been a teacher from the past three years and I'm just 21. I have started my teaching career when I was 18 years old. So as a part of a guest faculty, I attend to school, I give lectures to my students. And I feel that there is a lot of difference between, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, Sergi, I can hear you fine. Yes, you, you were saying there's a difference yeah. between... Yeah, there's a difference between physical learning and digital learning. So uh, I feel that, you know, uh, when you when you when you learn physically, when you teach physically, you know, uh, there's a kind of difference. We, we learn many things from the students around us. The, the culture is very important and the environment we study in is very important. I feel that. And, you know, it's really uh, very uh, inspiring to learn from students, uh, to gain knowledge from students around us. And in, in digital learning, you know, it's a way that so we only uh, able to, it's a one way of interaction. I mean, not in a two way of interaction much and we can't uh, engage much with the teachers and also with our peers who study. Right. So, so, yeah, you're, so, I, so you're feeling it, sorry, just so I understand, so your feeling is that although digital 
learning is powerful it's not as powerful as the physical experience in a classroom yeah yeah, yeah absolutely i absolutely i, I absolutely agree, agree with your point so i say that i mean this uh, we need to keep we need to engage students during these pandemic days so we need to keep them uh, we need to remember them that so study is important education is important uh, we need to keep them remembering those things but we can't effectively educate students during these pandemic and uh, during uh, i mean uh, through this uh, digital education so it's kind of a bit different and yeah yeah okay so th thank you because i think i expect we might hear a different point of view now from Bob Moon, I, I'm just, Bob, I wanted to bring you in because you raised an idea in the chat. I, I was saying, Bob, yesterday as we were preparing for this summit that often the chat is actually where the real conversation is happening. Mm -hmm. I saw you raised this, raised this point about an open school. Can you explain the idea? Because I, I hadn't heard it and it really intrigues me. Well, Tim Brighouse and I uh, wrote an article in The Guardian on May the 12th. And um, what essentially we did was propose the setting up of an open school in the same way that the Open University was established in the 1960s. My goodness me, that uh, Harold Wilson and Jenny Lee needed political um, determination to establish uh, the Open University. And I, uh, Valerie Amos's point about political de determination would certainly apply to setting up an open school. Uh, but We've and been, how would it work? It, well, explain, how would it work? It, well, this would have to be sorted out in detail now, but the concept would be that every child, when they came to school, also became part of the open school. So we wouldn't set the open school up as a, in, in contradiction to normal schooling, but it would enormously enrich the existing curriculum for teachers. It would have a major role in addressing some of the disadvantages we have. Remember that what happens with children is that they they fall behind and our face-to-face -face teaching system is not terribly good at helping people who've fallen behind. So we would see this as a massive contribution to the, uh, the catching up. And it, we remember hundreds of thousands of children are out of school for various periods of time. Millions at the moment are out of school. And this is something that might become a regular feature, we don't know, of our lives and so forth. So we think, and it, an open university equivalent at the school sector uh, could play a really valuable role. And this would be across the UK. So it would be across the four education systems that we're talking about. This is being now pursued by the BBC. Lord Hall wrote an article in The Guardian saying he really liked the idea. Uh, and uh, there is now a working party. The Nesta Foundation is uh, playing a role in coordinating the movement forward. And I really hope that we can... Um, get something out of this well, well we'll try and well, we'll try and fish out the your article from the guardian so people can share it in the chat and also um and also uh, tony hall lord hall's article too so we can begin to think about it in more detail thank you so much um valerie can we can we finish up if you if we like by i'm sorry to ask you to do this to, to bring us back to reality with a thump because the university sector is facing some real and immediate problems can you just give us the, the flavour of those before we, we close up this conversation? So, of course, the first thing is the uncertainty. Um, people have been, uh, people are scared um, uh, in terms of next steps in, uh, in relation to coronavirus in uh, the UK. What is social distancing uh, going to do in terms of the university experience? So uh, many universities are having to plan for a significant uh, drop in our international student numbers. Uh, and of course, our home students are asking us all kinds of questions about what will uh, the experience uh, be like. At the same time, um, I think many of us are advising uh, prospective uh, students that the next year is going to be uh, tough um, if they're thinking about not coming to university and perhaps going into uh, the employment uh, market. So uh, education is a very, very good um, alternative. I think we have to be honest and clear about what that experience might look like. Uh, we are not able to say definitively. Uh, the government guidance has changed, for example, from two meters to one meter in terms of uh, social distancing. I think every university will try to uh, do uh, some face-to-face -face teaching uh, on a uh, physical campus, uh, but we're all going to, to be doing much more creative and innovative uh, things online. And I think we'll also be looking at the structures of our, our programs, uh, when you start, uh, whether you can do 
uh, 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 as it were, chunks uh, of things, perhaps have a break and then come back and do another chunk, uh, whether we can compress uh, programs. So there's a lot of uh, thinking uh, going on uh, right now, uh, but it, there's going to be a huge financial hit uh, for universities because of, of course, tuition uh, fees are an important part of our income. And they also help us to cross subsidize a whole range of things. Uh, including uh, research, uh, including the work uh, that we do in terms of uh, widening uh, participation. So it's tough economic times for us uh, going forward. And I think the sector will look very, very different uh, in a year, 18 months time. Valerie, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly uncertain, as you, as you say, but, but I take your point right from the start that actually in amongst all this uncertainty, people really move fast and, and change. So I hope we can uh, keep hold of that spirit. Um, a it's a huge opportunity, James. It's, it, it's, it's, it's tough, it's difficult, mm. but there is a huge opportunity uh, here for us to really think about, you know, what has the last few years uh, delivered, you know, particularly with the placing of the student at the center of the experience, how can we continue uh, that, but in a very different uh, context? None of us knows if this goes, is going to last for another year, another two years, is there going to be uh, something uh, else? So yeah. adjusting to a climate where change, as it were, and I know we keep using this term where change is the new normal, um, but, but where it is going to be uh, more uncertain, but actually helping our young people to manage that uncertainty. I think it's something that higher education institutions have to be at the heart of. Well, well, well Valerie, thank you. I think I'm going I'm to leave this conversation with your, with, with what you said about leadership ringing in my ears, because there's something about leadership around ideas, what we learn, who teaches us, the rethinking, not just of history, clearly history, but across the board in our, in subjects. Um, the point you made at the start about leadership that understands the inequalities that exist, inequalities that exist in our education system, but also in the distribution of technology. And I suppose leadership, the point that you made and, and Claire Hookham was also making, which is we're going to have to make some real investments if we're going to change. And we're going to change, I thought Dan McKee's point was really good, change the perception of digital learning uh, as well as the, the fact of it. So. I hope that what we can do in the course of the day is start flesh out what that leadership needs to respond to and how it works. Uh, but you've just been brilliant for us in, in helping us start to think about how much can change and also personally in showing us that things can. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, and by the way, I should have said, I know you're headed off to uh, take charge of university. <laughs> so good luck there. And I hope uh, uh, that proves to be a you know rewarding and uh, and and not to mention enjoyable uh, thing to do. Just to say to everyone who's on the call, we move in a few minutes time, three or four minutes to the next session, because if we are going to change our education system, we would do well to learn from the education system that are doing great things in the world. So the next session is on, on which is the best education system in the world. Please do stay on. If you're a Tortoise member, I should say all of the notes around the education summit and the chat function continues in the app. So just go onto the app and you can continue the conversations that we're having in the chat room. But for, for now, uh, please join me. We can't applaud you. Uh, it doesn't work, unfortunately, Valerie, but we can give you a, a, a sort of very grateful wave goodbye. So thank you very much indeed for starting us off. James, thank you. And I hope the rest of the day goes well. Thanks so much.